Hello and welcome to another ATP, Atypical Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine war update news segment for the 23rd of February, 2023. Uh, as you will know, being here and not at ATP Geopolitics, I have been suspended by uh, YouTube over there. And I just want to take this opportunity. I'm going to be uh, contacting them today and doing so. I've got a day off of my normal job to, to do that. And I, ju I just want to say thank you so much to the huge outpouring of support uh, and a few naysayers as well, of course, uh, and the uh, just the the well wishing and and the way that you guys have uh, contacted YouTube. Uh, I'm going to see if that's had some effect today, um, but I really appreciate that and just a huge shout out to those who who have reached out to support the channel. Uh, massive appreciation there. Just want to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to Jan uh, Narkovic, Mitch Mazarol, uh, Jonathan Cairns, Gary Stillman, uh, and I will thank others later today. I really, really appreciate uh, all the support you give the channel. Um, what I, the last thing I'll say on this for now is what I was thinking about yesterday is the fact that if you like the stuff I do and if you appreciate the work or if you agree with my sentiments or whatever, you're never going to report me for whatever it is, misinformation, right? If you're ambivalent, you're not really going to do that. If you really don't like what I'm saying, you are going to want to do something like that. So in other words, there's no algorithm that's going to go through every video on YouTube and check them against facts. That's just too difficult. So you have to have a human being being the start of that process. You might have AI algorithms that then kicking in, but it's going to be human beings doing that. So this is almost one it's got to be like 100 percent russian pro pro kremlin uh voices reporting my channel and uh that there there has to be some mechanism in place to stop that ha happening because otherwise you just this just becomes this is literally part of the battlefield the information space this is fifth generation warfare taking place where the the, the soldiers of of the kremlin if you like pro-Russian, pro-Kremlin um, bots and voices are influencing the narrative and what information is allowed to be placed in the information space. And that, that can't be allowed to happen. It, it just can't. Anyway, so that, that's my thought, is, is that it's almost certainly uh, Russian bots or, or similar behind this. Um, anyway, let's get on to... The daily news. Right, I'm going to start in my usual place, uh, which is the Ukrainian released figures. Now, all the caveats to everything I say apply, as, as you can imagine I'm going to say, which is I am reporting to you from lots of sources about little nuggets of news that, that, that are coming out. Stuff like these figures are potentially inaccurate, potentially propaganda. Russia don't really produce... The same figures. I mean, someone posted the TASS uh, eight news agency uh, saying what the Russian Army D have said, which seems, you know, very propagandistic. But you could argue this is as well uh, their daily appraisal of, of all the things that have happened on the front line, which is like shed loads of Ukrainian soldiers have died in all these different places. Uh, I might have a look at that, see if there are any useful bits of information to garner from there. But uh, but yeah, all the caveats apply to everything I'm going to say here on in. I'm providing you with with information. It doesn't necessarily mean it's 100 percent true. You know, you can be the judge of that. Um, here, I find this indicative and useful for those kind of reasons. You know, looking at trends, seeing whether yesterday was a, a difficult day for the Russians, and it it does seem to be. So 790 liquidated personnel. That's above average. Uh, that's a high number for for those personnel lost. And you've got two big numbers here. So 16 tanks and 24 APCs. That's a huge uh, set of numbers for, for armoured losses. I don't know whether that's a reflection of what's going on around the Kremlin area. So there's there are there is lots of video footage coming out of that particular region in terms of Russian losses. Uh, we've had reports of T-90s being lost, multiple T-90s, one being captured, actually. I'll show you in a second. Uh, you've got seven artillery systems, 
one anti-aircraft warfare system, three drones, three vehicles and fuel tanks, two pieces of special equipment. But again, 24 APCs and 16 tanks along with a high number of personnel means that things are difficult. Now, as I've said, I think Kremlin area is difficult, but arguably for both sides. Uh, and Bakhmut is difficult, uh, definitely for both sides. So there are huge losses for the Russians, but also the Russians have made gains in Bakhmut. When it comes to my frontline update, you'll see that Bakhmut's not looking too good. Um, so going back to Kremlin, here are two Russian uh, T-90s. So this is like their, their best tank. It depends how upgraded previous tanks are and whatnot. But but in general, you know, as, as the base frame, the T-90s are are uh, your most modern tanks other than the T-14 Armata that aren't really in existence. Uh, I haven't seen any significant Russian advance in the area. They are stuck in these forests and the fields north of it. So there, there are these losses, quite a bit of video and uh, other footage coming out now uh, in that area. Now, this is a picture of a T-90 that's been captured on the back of an American Oshkosh HET M1070 uh, truck. Um, uh, most modern working Russian tank, T-90M, Trent Tolenko does uh, a whole thread on looking at this and saying, I'm not so interested about the T90. I am particularly interested in this truck and its trailer and talking about the importance of logistics and how the uh, Ukrainians have a lot more of these vehicles, armored recovery vehicles and such like that can take these uh, captured or damaged vehicles away whereas the Russian don't seem to have that capacity and that capability even. They don't, they uh, barely seen any um, evidence of Russians being able to retrieve equipment from the battlefield. Uh, other Another loss here, Su-25 has crashed in Belgorod returning from a mission. Pilot died. The plane crashed in a deserted area. The cause of the plane crash was allegedly a technical malfunction. Could have been hit. Don't know. Uh, what is important about these, I always say this, is not so much the plane being lost, but the 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 pilot. Experienced pilots or pilots in general, they they are not so easily replaceable as the planes themselves. And this that will be more of a loss to the Russian air ca uh, air force than the plane itself. Um, OK, let's go on a look at military aid. The Ministry of Defence of Canada has published uh, photos of Ukrainian tankers training on Leopard 2s under the leadership of Canadian instructors in Poland. Lots of talk about these the, the Leopard 2 training in Poland, lots of nations involved in that training as well. So that's uh, fantastic to see for the Ukrainians' point of view. Spanish Defence Minister Margarita Robles has announced that Spain will send six Leopard 2A4s, not the most recent, but pretty decent, uh, they're operating now on two A7s. Uh, they won't be given, but two A6s are the, are the most recent leopards that are being given. But two A4s are good, good tanks to to Ukraine and could send more if necessary. So this is really good. Spain seemed to be suddenly, you know, coming to the fore. Robles expressed Spain's willingness during a Congress debate on the military aid provided to Ukraine. Well. Adding to that, the Spanish PM has arrived in Kiev. He has uh, been met at the, the train station by um, the deputy foreign minister and is scheduled to visit Irpin and Bucha and meet with President Zelensky today. We will stand by Ukraine and its people until peace returns to Europe, he tweeted. Just uh, Zelensky is meeting so many foreign... He must be the foreign dignitary, the, the, the leader of any country that's met most... The more other foreign leaders than any other any other leader in the world. So Zelensky is just this he must have this rotating door in Kiev at the moment of, of people coming in, which is fantastic for all the Ukrainians, of course. Ukrainian volunteers with the support of the of the, of the Petro Poroshenko Foundation bought 20 Foden 8x6 carrier trucks for the Ukrainians capable of transporting cargo weighing up to 18 tons. This kind of goes back to what I was just talking about about that Oshkosh truck, is that th this kind of um capability really is a capability that ukrainians have the russians are are digging out trucks from the 1960s to, to you know to be able to transport their uh supplies and, and fuel and whatnot and it, there is a real asymmetry there um talking about ammunition now a former railway equipment factory and i've shown video footage from this factory before but there's even more is coming out in pennsylvania shifted its activities to produce ammo for ukrainian forces they work day and night to keep up with the needs of con of contract as they call it which is obviously ukraine they are it's, it's fascinating as you can watch the, these automated machines and workers working on the this ammunition you know it's quite mesmerizing actually but so 
there are factories that are really upscaling and uh, we're also just starting to produce uh, munitions that might not have previously done so for the the war effort in ukraine uh, to try and get the ammunition produced to the levels that ukraine uses it um so UK will, and this is, uh, this makes me smile. The UK will unblock the fighter jet coalition. That's a verdict of Andrew Yermak. He's like the head of the uh, the um, Zelensky administration, kind of how, like the chief of White House, basically. Uh, but for the Ukrainians, I think that's how I, I think he is. Uh, speaking to reporters today, he said that many countries are willing to donate planes, but won't be the first. Following his recent visit to Britain with Zelensky, Yemak hopes the UK will be the first. This is like when when you welcome your mate in, he said, all right, Jim, good to see you. Oh, thanks so much for that 10 quid you're going to lend me. And Jim's like, I am? Oh, okay. Uh, I better look for my 10 quid. Okay. Uh, it's this idea that uh, thanks so much for Britain who are going to start the ball rolling with the jet fighters and Britain's going around going, oh, I'm not really sure that's the case. So you might call this presumptuous or whatever, but uh, I, I think that's quite, you know, it, it's, it's quite ballsy of, of the Ukrainians here. I don't know that the UK really can unlock the fighter jet coalition not with our planes. I was listening somewhere recently that our air force is often the f the first people that we send to help el uh, elsewhere, and actually there's quite a lot of overstretch in the in the air force. We don't have enough kits, uh, and then you know there's the arguments that it's the wrong type of planes anyway for this kind of conflict. Uh, so I don't know that UK will unlock that that jet fighter coalition, but you know, we'll see. Uh, and remaining on Britain, uh, Britain warm, warming up weapon output to help Ukraine, says the defence minister. So Ben Wallace, he's like, I'm no fan of the Conservatives, but he is a really s safe pair of hands as a defence minister, Ben Wallace. In fact, he's done such a good job, they were wondering whether he might go for leader, but I don't think he's got the skill set outside of defence, like the general to be to be going for like a prime minister or anything. So I think he, he's, he's sensibly kept to his area of expertise. However, I listened to Ukraine, the latest podcast, which is done by The Telegraph, so right leaning, and they interviewed the shadow uh, foreign, uh, the shadow defence minister, so the Labour Party. Now, just to let you know, um, you might not be interested, you're not interested in UK politics, but Labour will probably get voted in next because the, the Conservative Party have had a bit of a nightmare over, the, over this last cycle. Uh, and uh, it's probably time, isn't it? You have long enough with one party, generally the country flips to the other. But there's lots of things to think about with regard to Scotland and, you know, first past the post and all sorts of things that, that work against the, the left in the UK. And it, the vote is generally split five ways between five different parties depending on where you are in the country whereas the the right vote is not split at all and it's very difficult for Labour to get in but they probably will get in with a coalition the point of me saying this is the defense minister so if this happens in 2024 the defense minister as it as it is a, a moment shadow defense minister is really competent like I listened to him on he was interviewed on the Telegraph podcast and I came away thinking that guy sounded absolutely on the money he knows so going for if if labor got in and you went from ben wallace to to lee he like good hands really good hands so that that's that's great news at least that's how i interpret it um asked about whether britain had the commercial capacity to continue to provide ukraine with weapons such as artillery cells wallace said we have laid contracts we've started to already now receive some deliveries of, of that of our own recent stocking and also some of it to Ukraine. He said in the past governments would have looked at their stockpiles and blow the dust off equipment to see what was there but now the game had changed with a much more aggressive and dangerous Russia on the edges of Europe. He said shells could be made fairly quickly but and this this is fantastic because this is typical British underwhelming. The key is to make sure we place the orders and we started placing those orders over the last 10 months and that starts to sort of warm up those production lines. So where America like ramping up these factories and, and pumping out ammunition shells and saying, look, we're really working hard to do this. <laughs> Britain's like, yeah, we're starting to warm those production lines. 
Um, but Wallace has frequently said any delivery of fighter jets would be a long-term project, possibly more, uh, possibly once a Russian war on Ukraine was over and would not be drawn on uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's offer of long-range weapons. So it's interesting. Still don't know what those would be. But the question opposition lawmakers have is how equipment, how much equipment does Britain have? Wallace has said. Britain could offer additional Challenger tanks to the 14 already promised, but that it would depend on the threat level and also the country's defence needs. I don't see why we don't... I've said this many times, given that all 79 uh, Challengers aren't going to be upgraded to Challenger 3, uh, we might as well give them. I mean, what's the point of those having those tanks built? It is for exactly this, to, to fight against threats within the context of the UK, which is, at the moment, Russia in Ukraine. Which is, why else do we build this? Send them to Ukraine. Uh, keeping on the UK, in the north of England, uh, Ukrainian recruits are trained in trench warfare. The UK and nine international training partners are ensuring that Ukraine can stand up to Russian aggression and retake territory. Uh, this is the kind of training that I think is really useful. This is very much looking like the uh, the sort of environment that they're fighting in in Ukraine. Um, and as I've said before, if they're getting decent training then this is uh, a competitive advantage over the Russians. If they're getting decent training and decent equipment and being sent to the front lines with that, then and the, Rus and the Russians aren't, so lots of ifs there. But if that is the case, then that is a competitive advantage that the Ukrainians will have over the Russians, and they need to eke out every advantage. Uh, the G7 countries are planning to support Ukraine with an uh, international monetary fund by the end of March. Uh, they are talking about a multi-year aid package where up to 16 billion dollars as according to bloomberg so that is uh will be significant ukraine will need not just military aid not just humanitarian aid but also sort of kind of raw money to keep the country going and let alone to think about rebuilding um so uh fantastic news for ukraine there i hope there aren't too many strings attached um, but there you go. Uh, last night again explosions in mariupol and the question is what's hitting mariupol if it's very close to the coast, then is it out of range of HIMARS? Probably. So then what is being used? I talked about w whether it's the uh, Turkish uh, Gimlers guided multiple launch rocket system with 150 kilometer range that we don't really know how many of them are in Ukraine and whether they have ammunition for them and, how, and whether they're being used. But it could be that. Some people are saying GLSDB, which are ground launch small, small diameter bombs that have quite a good range and could glide, but I don't know if the range is anything more than HIMARS particularly. Uh, one renowned journalist in Ukraine reports hits on the airport near Mariupol. Andriy Sapilenko says two powerful explosions were heard between 10 and 11 p.m. Uh, they say they were arrivals at Russian warehouses at the airport on the western outskirts of the city. So Mariupol seems to be quite a, a major target uh, at the moment. Belgorod, there is there has also been prob probably an ammunition, possibly an ammunition dump hit in Belgorod region, which is in Russia. So within striking distance. Uh, so there have been targets take, uh, taken out in in the Belgorod region for for months and months. It's it's quite common for the Ukrainians to hit there. All right. Talking about the Russians, there's been over the last couple of days claims uh, of. The Russians not having enough ammunition. In fact, there's also been, I'm going to do a little thread on that in my extra, the ammunition they do have is in, ter some of it is in terrible condition. There's some photos that are just quite shocking. Uh, both Alexander Khodorkovsky, commander of the Vostok Battalion, and Grey Zone, Wagner affiliated uh, Telegram channel or channel, uh, complain about Wagner and Russian forces being barely supplied with enough ammunition. This is happening so often now that this is definitely an issue. It is an issue. And you have, uh, on, on top of that, you've had, um, where are we? Uh, here we are, sorry, uh, Prigozhin has been really shouting about this for now two or three days to the point where he has uh, sent, uh, sent out a picture or put a picture on the socials of a whole heap of, I could click on this and show you, a whole heap of Russian uh, Wagner dead bodies, basically, uh, as if to say, look, this is what happens if you don't give us ammunition, if you don't give us the shares. 
uh, and trying to get the Russian MOD to kind of start moving on on providing artillery ammunition for Wagner. Anyway, that seems to have worked. The uh, Prigozhin reports that the ammunition train has started moving, referring towards his tirade yesterday against the Russian military leadership, complaining about the lack of ammunition and an immediate need for it. So there is no doubt that at least the Wagner do not have enough ammunition. And it's also getting reported by Russians that other battalions do not have ammunition. So that they are struggling with ammunition stocks. And this was the one thing that everyone was saying originally that they had so much of that this was never going to be a problem. And it turns out they don't have that much of it or enough of it to sustain the levels with which it was being used previously. And Prigozhin had to produce a picture of huge amounts of dead bodies uh, and, and I, I could show you that, but I won't, uh, of, of Russian dead bodies in order to get people moving on that. OK, let's go and talk quickly about a few geopolitical points. So here we have, there's been a big rally in Russia, in Moscow, stadium full of people waving Russian flags, lots of music, all the musicians dressed up in army gear and with Z caps on and stuff, like bizarre I don't know you'd ever get that in Britain. Like the, the music scene is not really <laughs> pro military. Uh, but anyway, you've got Putin talking about right now the fighting is ongoing on Russia's historical borders. So, harking back to this emp era of empire. And as Shashank Joshi, the defense correspondent for The Economist, says, imagine if a European leader said this today about a war in part of the former British, French, Belgian, Spanish or Portuguese empire. It would be considered completely and utterly deranged. But, you know, that's Putin for you. Uh, but, yeah, very, very forced kind of uh, flag waving opportunity to get together and, and sing songs about how great Russia is. I do wonder how much of the crowd is really pro that. And how much is kind of like them being forced to go. But having said that, there is so much state controlled narrative being pumped out by TV stations and radio stations that a lot of people will genuinely be feeling that. Um, Putin cancels a decree underpinning Moldova's sovereignty in the separatist conflict. And this is pretty important stuff here because actually. Uh, there's been talk over the last few days that Moldova and Ukraine have intelligence to support uh, that you, you, uh, Russia have intentions on um, basically bringing Moldova into the fold as far as, uh, you know, it's similar to what I was talking about yesterday with Belarus uh, and evidence that uh, Russia have intentions on maybe weaponizing Transnistria, if you like. So this Reuters piece says uh, Vladimir Putin revoked the tu on Tuesday a 2012 decree that in part underpinned Moldova's sovereignty in resolving the future of the Transnistria region, a Moscow-backed separatist region which borders Ukraine and where Russia keeps troops. There's about 1,500 troops there. The decree, which included a Moldova component, outlined Russia's foreign policy 11 years ago, which assumed Moscow's closer relations with the European Union. And the United States. The order, the order revoking the 2012 document was published on the Kremlin's website and states that the decision was taken to, quote, ensure the national interests of Russia in connection with the profound changes taking place in international relations. Uh, of course, Russia are kind of denying that, that they are under, um, you know, that they are pulling the rug out from Moldova's sovereignty. Uh, but, you know, we, we shall see. Uh, TASS is playing the BS card again. So Ukrainian Azov troops, they say, and saboteurs are going to dress up as Russian troops and stage an alleged offensive in Transnistria. So, okay, on the one hand, they are revoking documents concerning Transnistria and Moldova. And on the other hand, they're calling out the Ukrainians for saying the Azovs are going to dress up in Russian clothes and start uh, an offensive in Transnistria, which sounds very much like the Russians are going to do that. It's straight out their playbook. Uh, there have been, act, there's been activity increasing apparently in Transnistria. Uh, so the Ukrainians have been sending some troops there, but does that actually play into the Russian narrative or is indeed Ukraine going to do uh, an offensive in Transnistria? All these things uh, to consider, but it's definitely part of the world to look out for. Um, we have had the foreign uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Kuleba, giving a speech to United Nations. I'm not going to talk in depth about this. I might talk about it in my extra. The speech is very, it's a good speech. 
uh, but it was in stark contrast to Putin's speech in uh, Russia. We just it's far more where where's Putin's speech is talking about oh the horrible West, you know, trying to de- yeah, the the decadent West and degrade moral degradation and all this kind of stuff, but, you know, poking holes at the rest of the, uh, poking a stick at the rest of the world and uh, and almost being isolationist. Whereas this speech is almost diametrically opposed. It's talking about how wonderful the whole world is and very inclusive and you know working together and it almost if you take these two speeches together you've got on the one hand russia on its own increasingly isolated uh whinging about everyone else and on the other hand you've got a very positive approach of the rest of the world and russia are the bad guys and the rest of the world you know need to work together and isn't it wonderful that you've we've got this unity and very positive outlook um taking into account obviously Russia's activities. So I just found that that Kuleba's speech and Putin's speech were showed two completely different approaches to how to posture in terms of you know geopolitical stance. Uh and the last thing to say is the US is considering the release of intelligence on China's potential arms transfer to Russia. There's been a lot of talk about whether Russia uh, are going to be receiving arms from china somewhere down the line whether china are going to decide to they they've apparently been giving them non-lethal aid in terms of like helmet um body armor and stuff like that potentially uh, but they are wondering whether to step that up to lethal aid and america have said we've got you know or they've got uh, intelligence to suggest that they are considering that and they're actually willing, or they're wondering whether they are going to release that intelligence to the wider world, into the public. So in recent weeks, says this uh, Wall Street Journal report, uh, in recent weeks, Western nations have picked up on intelligence that Beijing might end its previous self-imposed restraint on weapons supplies to Russia, according to US and European officials. Although it appears that China hasn't yet made a final decision, Beijing had previously been cautious to confine its support to financial assistance and oil purchases, uh, the officials said. But the stance now appears to be shifting according to the latest intelligence assessments. Until now, a senior Western official said, there, quote, has been a certain amount of ambiguity about what practical help China might give Russia. The official said the intelligence the US and its allies have now is, quote, much less ambiguous. In other words, they definitely have intelligence and it's it's pretty clear that Russia are considering helping, uh, sorry, you, uh, China are considering helping Russia. The Biden administration, beginning with Russia's pre-invasion military buildup near Ukraine, has released a virtually unprecedented amount of declassified intelligence on Moscow's military plans. It's amazing how much the intelligence space, uh, sorry, the information space uh, and uh, social media has been a an arm of all sides here with with dumping in this case like actual intelligence or hints or rumors and it's you know being used as a way to kind of wage war and try and control the narrative and the US the US administration has released as it says here an unprecedented amount of declassified intelligence uh, prior to the prior to the war they're very open with like this is the intelligence we have that russia are going to start this war and the uk with with similar not many others uh and including ukraine and then the war happened and us and uk were like we told you so we you know um anyway uh intelligence released on moscow's military plans its armed trade with iran and related topics direct director of national intelligence avril haynes said last week that while it's way too early to tell, officials so far haven't seen any degradation of US intelligence sources because of the releases. So in other words, the releases seem to have been, there seems to be no ramification for for producing those intelligence releases. Uh, Though the Biden administration has been working to declassify the intelligence for possible release, no final decision has been made uh, on a public disclosure or the timing of it, officials said. So you might see this release of China of intelligence on China. US and European officials said Beijing wouldn't necessarily provide advanced weapons, but would likely backfill what Russian forces have lost on the battlefield in Ukraine, such as ammunition or have been unable to produce because of sanctions such as electronics. It's not an issue of technology, said uh, Vasily Kassin, 
a China specialist and the director of the Center for Comprehensive European and International Studies in, at Moscow's Higher School of Economics. It's primarily an issue of production capacity. And in terms of production capacity, China, in many aspects, especially we talk about ground force weapons, might be stronger than Russia and the whole of NATO combined. So if China were to start giving Russia weapons, this is the only... I've said before, it's the only way Russia can win this war is if they get considerable help from China. But if that happens, we're, we're talking kind of World War Three type affairs. Um, at the UN, Washington officials are backing a resolution demanding that Russia immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw all of its military forces from the territory of Ukraine with it, within its internationally recognized borders and call for the cessation of hostilities. One Western official said US allies are hoping to get more than 130 votes on Thursday. Such resolutions in the General Assembly won't, don't have binding force in contrast with Security Council resolutions. Still, US officials hope that a message from the majority of UN member states will show broad opposition to Russia's invasion and will begin to outline a blueprint for peace that includes Russia's withdrawal. So there could be an interesting, uh, that's today Thursday, so it could be an interesting situation. I wonder how many votes they get. There's an awful lot of countries in the world that aren't so open in their defence or support of Ukraine and uh, that aren't so open in their condemnation of Russia. Uh, a lot of countries, the recent Munich security conference, there were some countries there that were complaining that why is this all about uh, Ukraine and Russia? You know, there are other considerations in the world. Uh, and yet the West is making this all about Ukraine. So there, there is there's a very interesting geopolitical uh, situation in the world where uh, not all countries are as obsessed with the Ukraine war as the West uh, is and indeed Russia. Anyway, there you go. That's the news update for today. A bit of a longer one. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you so much for your support. Take care and I'll speak to you in the frontline update.